Welcome to the Holman United Methodist Church, the Church of the Bells. We are located at 3320 West Adams Boulevard in the historic West Adams District of Los Angeles, California. The Reverend Christian Washington serves as our interim senior pastor. We are pleased to be worshiping in person at 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock each Sunday morning and invite you to join with us. Good morning again. Today is the second Sunday of Easter, Holy Communion, April 7th, 2024. We encourage you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Type youtube.com slash Holman Church in your internet browser, or you can go to YouTube directly and type Holman Church in the search box. There you will see worship services and other engaging content, Please click the thumbs up button, subscribe, and then click the bell icon to receive notifications. And again, please subscribe. Holman, as well as churches around the world, need your financial support and prayers. We offer those prayers to you and wish you a safe and blessed week. This ministry is broadcast live on radio station KJLH 102.3 in the greater Los Angeles area. You can also view it live on the Holman Church YouTube channel everywhere. This provides broad outreach opportunities for the listening and viewing audience. We are grateful for this opportunity to be in ministry with the greater community through the generosity of our radio broadcast sponsors. We hope you will consider becoming a sponsor to honor a loved one, celebrate a special occasion, or promote your business or event. Call Holman Church at 323-703-5868 for more information. You can also contribute online to our ministry activities at homeandchurch.com. Let us partner with you in sharing your news. Thank you for listening, and we now join the church service currently in progress.
Good morning. I trust everyone is doing well this beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome to Home and United Methodist Church, where our vision is to be a place where bells are rung as we gather for dynamic worship, grow through inspired learning, and go into joyful service to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our mission is to fulfill the Great Commission by inviting people into discipleship with Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Please join me in our call to worship. Please rise as you are able. It is good for God's people to gather together in unity. We are here at the invitation of God. In this place, God's love and grace flow into our lives. In this place, God's blessings abound. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Please join now with the home and choir singing hymnal number 310 in the United Methodist hymnal. He lives and love lifted me found on the bulletin insert.
You may be seated. The home and choir will minister to us in music with But Thanks Be to God by George Frederick Hamlin. morning. As we enter into a time of prayer, we are remembering, as seen in your bulletin, the family of Toy Hightower, whose brother Frank passed on Monday, April 1st. The family of Mrs. Mabel Lloyd Cowherd, sister-in-law of Ann Lloyd, who made her transition on Monday, April 1st as well. The family of Cheryl Sweeney, whose brother passed Friday, April 5th. And the family of Reverend Cecil Chip Murray who passed on Friday, April 5th. We're also remember sta remembering Stacy Banks, Marjorie Ellington, Lorraine Flanagan, Sharon Jackson, Dr. Harold Jordan, Dr. Barbara Lake, and Freddie Muse Jr. As we remember the people of Haiti, Baltimore, and Gaza, today we pray for the souls of those who perished in Taiwan's fatal earthquake and the families left behind. As people of earthquake country, we understand. If there's names or circumstances that were not voiced here, would you please add those verbally now, the names or circumstances you'd like us to pray for? Say them now. Let us pray. Lord God, who chooses moment by moment to love us, who chooses to sustain us, who chooses to heal us, and even choose to wrap yourself in flesh and be among us, 
We lift these to you now. We lift these names that you know. We lift these circumstances that you understand better than we ever could and pray your mercy, pray your grace, pray your healing, pray your favor, pray your peace. And as we who are here with limited knowledge continue to lift these to you, we run out of words and we run out of things to say to you, much like the disciples did with Jesus. So in these moments, we return to you the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sandra Bishop. I'm the chairman of the Staff Pastor Parish Relations Committee at Holman United Methodist Church, and I have a letter to share with you. It reads, Sandra Bishop and members of Holman UMC, on behalf of Bishop Dottie Escobedo Frank and her cabinet, I share with you that after deep prayer and consultation, it is Bishop Escobedo Frank's intent to appoint the Reverend Victor Cyrus Franklin as senior pastor at Holman UMC as of July 1st, 2024. Reverend Victor was discerned for his, this appointment because he brings gifts in proclamation and worship, administrative and financial management, strategic vi vision and implementation, and a commitment to developing lay leadership. We believe that Reverend Cyrus Franklin has the gifts and graces to lead for such a time as this and pray you will welcome him and his family with open arms as you embark upon the new season together. As a church leader and developer, he is uniquely gifted to lead Holman UMC into an era of vibrant growth during such challenging times. As a commitment to ministry of justice, peace and compassion, Reverend Cyrus Franklin and leaders from Holman and Inglewood First UMC will explore possibilities for collaborative parish ministry. In order to continue this exploration, Reverend Cyrus Franklin will be appointed as senior pastor of Holman UMC while maintaining administrative oversight over Inglewood First UMC. In this configuration, Holman will receive a to-be-named associate pastor, while Inglewood First will receive a dedicated site pastor. Reverend Cyrus Franklin will work together with Pastor Christian Washington and your lay leadership for a smooth and effective ministry transition. On behalf of our bishop, I thank you for your faithfulness as a congregation over many years. I am excited to see what the next season of ministry will bring to for and through your community. 
as you go from strength to strength in partnership with Reverend Cyrus Franklin. In ministry together, Reverend Dr. Tu Itahi, District Superintendent. Thank you. Okay. Our scripture this morning is found in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, and verse 13. For today's scripture, we turn to the New International Version of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 8, and again, verse 13. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the scripture. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are no prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be silent. They will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Home Choir will continue in Ministry of Music with the song by Burt Bacharach's classic, What the World Needs Now is Love. And after which, the next voice you will hear will be that of Pastor Christian Washington, who will bring a series entitled, Love Is. Good morning, everybody. If you know this song, sing along with us. What the world needs now is love.
Oh, show some more love for our music team, for the Holman Choir. Robert and the Maestro, and our liturgist today, Tim. Um, I talk about my mama a lot. I know. I know. But y'all just don't know. Uh, I, I grew up in a house, as I said last week, it was full of music. And my mother, one of her favorite albums was Dionne Warwick sings Burt Bacharach's Hits. I'm telling you, I know that song backwards that they just sang. I know every verse. I know every inflection. There's a, there's a, there's a modulation in it. I, I was ready for that. I'm ready for it all. But it, but it had all those different songs. Up. There's a place for us. Somewhere a place for us. That's on it, right? Um, what's it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? Which is a very hard song to sing. I mean, just song after song after song after song. And, and that stuff just hits me. But did you catch the words? Uh, uh, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. Uh, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. And then if you caught it, it turns into a prayer. Lord, we don't need another mountain. I mean, it turns into a prayer. God, please, we're pleading with you for more love. Uh, thank you all. I really, I really appreciate that. That, that, that really kind of hits me. That hit me good. Uh, I am excited to make the transition from being your pastor to being John the Baptist. <laughs> I get to be the one who is the voice crying out in the wilderness, the one who's, who's preparing the way. Uh, and, and I've been um, so many places in my life and times, sung a lot of songs, made some bad rhymes, uh, been to a lot of conferences, done a lot of work in a lot of different places and churches. Uh, and in Methodism, there aren't very many people as talented and gifted with graces as Victor Cyrus Franklin. There just aren't. Not at his age. Not at his age. We have, a, we have a, a very, very, we have a dearth of folk with that kind of gifting at his age. You all, he's, he's a son of this place. Uh, I hope that uh, three months from now when I leave, you all will call me a son of this place too. Uh, but it's, 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 it's wonderful to see that he's, he's all grown up now. All the letters behind his name, all the letters in front of his name, and, and he is ready. He's doing a $90 million project over in Inglewood. That's one of the most spectacular things done by a church in this country. Dealing with the things, it's, it's applying love and seeing love in action under his, under his direction and under his anointing. So I, I think y'all are not only going to be in great hands, but I'm just looking forward to coming back and just seeing you go from glory to glory. And if I can just be any little part of that, I certainly, I certainly will. So let's uh, start a new series. I, uh, last, the first series I did here uh, last month was called Destroying the Fear Factor. I wanted to deal with fear up front. But you can't deal with fear without starting to say, okay, if we can deal with our fear, overcome it, get out of the boat, now what? And so the next month, we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about love. And we're going to talk about it in the context of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that he planted in Corinth. Now, it's important to get background for all of this. So if you don't mind, let me kind of walk you through what's happening here. Um, Paul, as you know, was... Uh, called directly by Jesus according to the story. And, and now he's out moving around, uh, evangelizing Asia Minor. And as he, he gets to this area called Corinth, this city of Corinth, which was one of the jewels of the uh, Roman Empire at the time. Talking the fourth, fifth century, uh, a jewel, an, an incredible, incredible place um, um, from fourth, fifth century BCE on to the time of, 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 of Paul. And Paul gets there, and the best way to describe Corinth, this place where he planted a thriving church, would be Corinth would be like Vegas today. Oh, y'all y'all acting like you've never been to Vegas. I'm not talking about Circus Circus Vegas. <laughs> I'm talking about downtown Vegas. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, 
Tyson fight Vegas. I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, Corinth was that kind of place that you'd go to and what happened in Corinth? Stayed in Corinth. Corinth was a place you'd go if you were a dignitary somewhere else and you need to find a place where you could go and let your hair down and do your thing and, and turn up and nobody would need to know because no one was telling any stories, nobody was telling any lies. It was, it was known as a place where people who lived there were called loose. Corinth was a place full of loose people. Loose men, loose women, loose living. It even had a temple. Its most prominent temple was the temple of Aphrodite. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. That was not your normal temple. That wasn't like coming in here. It wasn't like coming into a Catholic church. It wasn't like coming into a, a synagogue. It was, it, was, it was a place where you... Um, Well, there's a, I'll think in terms of songs, and the song that comes to my mind right, right now is that, and every night all the men would come around and lay their money down. That was the temple of Aphrodite. That was Corinth. And Paul goes there because Paul was a bad man. Paul had a lot of zeal. He was part zealot, part uh, Roman citizen, part person who was erudite, erudite and, and educated, spoke uh, fluent Greek, was, was educated in stoicism, educated by the best rabbis too. He was a person who was dual citizen, who was perfectly, perfectly set up to go to places like this, speak their language and reach them where they are. That was Paul. Paul got here and planted a church that took off, was thriving. The people were actually there for 18 months of his, his tenure growing and moving countercultural to what was happening in the rest of Corinth. They were doing it. Now, there were Corinthians, which means Corinthian folks are turnip folk. And I'm not talking about turnips. I'm talking about turn up! <laughs> Corinthian people were like Pentecostals as opposed to Methodists. And I'm not talking about shouting Methodists. I'm talking about like Pentecostals. I'm talking about all the gifts, all the, all the shouting, all the running around. That was Corinth. Corinthian church was a, an experience, an, an energetic experience. It was over the top. Paul was there for 18 months, and he's called away to Ephesus for another three years. But while, while he was in Ephesus, uh, some folks started writing him letters to say things have regressed since you left. Things are not the way you left them here. Uh, the people now are starting to use the communion wine as if they were actually at the club. Communion wine as bottle service. People are imbibing and getting drunk at the communion table. People are eating up all the bread before people can get to the table. And only people who got to the table were the ones who got there first who were the more privileged folk. So they're starting to have caste system in the temple, in the church. Uh, things are really falling apart. Oh, this other thing's happening. We're charismatic, so all the gifts are happening. People are speaking in tongues. People are prophesying. People are laying hands on folk. People are, are, people are falling out. All this stuff is happening, Paul, and it's just crazy right now. The book of Corinthians is actually a couple of letters that Paul wrote back to them. Remember, this is a oral society, so they're not there uh, reading about things. Most of them can't read. So he sent this back to be read to them. Uh, the first few chapters are, are Paul trying to correct their theology. Uh, and, and he introduces a, a wonderful model and device to help them with that. And he called it, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. First time this has ever been said. Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? In other words, God no longer is way out there. God no longer is living among us as Jesus. God is now disembodied yet resident in you. You are the temple now, not this building. It's good theology, y'all. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, if, and, and as such... How should you act? How should you behave knowing that the divine is actually in you? 
It's been about eight chapters talking about that. But at the same time all this was happening, there were other evangelists and preachers coming through because they heard there's some church folk over in Corinth. Far be it from us not to go and scatter the sheep a little bit. In comes a wonderful preacher named Apollos. And Apollos, unlike Paul, was the handsome, well-spoken orator. Paul was the bull in the china China shop. Paul was straight, no chaser. Paul telling you, you're going to hell. (laughs) Paul telling you, you you need to uh, do this Roman thing and confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God raised you from the dead and then you'll be saved. Paul had, had a whole systematic theology that he was putting together in writing. Apollos was still more Jewish more of a Judaizer, more of a, it's, you need to continue with our food laws. You need to continue with circumcision, non-starter. You should continue with the customs and the, all of the laws of Deuteronomy. They're not, they're not gone anymore. They're, they're still here. Follow the Jewish way, but be Messianic Jews. Uh, what, it, what ensued was something we call a church split. There were some, it says in, in the scriptures, it's in this chapter, there's some that it says followed Apollos, some followed Paul, some even followed Peter because one of the criticisms of Paul was that you weren't around with Jesus. Peter walked with the man. Now, all we're talking about is Peter. Peter was essentially the pope, the first pope. So they were like, we're going to stick with the pope because you're, you're this other guy. And even there were some who just said, we don't want anybody between us and Jesus. We just follow Jesus. We don't even want some exalted preacher or exalted leader. At least four movements happening there where there was one. And lots of division. Now people don't like each other. You know how that happens in church? Not here. But but sometimes church folk get to a place where they don't like each other over the rules. Let me come down here. I got. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm John the Baptist now. So watch out. <laughs> so the rule says X. We need to do it like X. We've always done it that way. Well, Jesus came to set us free, and Paul says we no longer need to do that. You're not a rule follower. You're a sinner. I hate you. You're a rule follower. You don't love anybody. You're wrong. Hmm. Maybe don't get it that way. Paul, in, mi- in the midst of all this, gets to chapter 9. Now Paul is starting to talk about uh, the things that they're saying against him. And he's making his case for being an apostle just like everybody else. He's making a case so well that he's even letting us know that we are not much different than the apostles either. Right? Priesthood of all believers kind of comes out of here. We get to chapter 12 and he starts to deal with those gifts. Oh, there are all these gifts. And he starts to essentially uh, enumerate them and define them so they end up in a language, a lexicon of the gifts. So they can all about what word knowledge or word wisdom or, or healing. They know what these things mean now because he's given them definitions for them. That's chapter 12. But he also introduces one other new concept and that is called the body of Christ. That these gifts are, part, are, are like a hand or a finger. You have this gift, you're this. You have this gift, you're your foot. You have this gift, you're a nose. And then why would a hand ever cut off a nose on its same body? You're the body of Christ. Say the body of Christ. Yeah, so you, you have different members, but you're all the same body. That's chapter 12. You have all these gifts. Great, that's wonderful. But remember that you're part of something bigger than just you and your gift. Follow? Chapter 14 then says, all right, so you have these gifts, but how do we administer these gifts? How do they work in a church context? How do they work when we're gathered together? You can't be screaming out something in tongues and not interpret it. You, you can't be just free willy and sign all over the place. You can't do all those things. You need to do things decently 
and in order. Paul sounds very Methodist to me right here. Decent and in order is chapter 14. Let's clean up this gift thing. Well, sandwiched between what are the gifts and how do we administer them is chapter 13, which Chuck Woolery would call the love chapter. That's for somebody. That's for somebody, yeah. The love chapter, which I, I would, get, would uh, say is um, actually begins not where this break is, that it begins actually one verse before in chapter 12. The last verse of chapter 12 says, and now let me show you a more excellent way. Let me show you a better way to live. What it's really saying is, now let me show you the best way to live. We've talked about these gifts. We've talked about all this, these other things that are all nice. They're cool. They're wonderful. Yes, you're part of the body of Christ. But here is a better way to live. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, if I don't have love, I am nothing. Chapter 13 starts to deal with the fact that these people don't like each other. And yet they are the body of Christ. How do you reconcile all that? They're fighting each other. They're dividing from each other. How do you reconcile that? And Paul offers one word, love. That love is the key. That what, what y'all need is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that's just too little love here. You need love. Now, I want to really focus in on what Paul's talking about, but I need to also do just a little bit of work here in background on this word love. In time, and in the Greek language, love is not one word. Love is a, a, a plethora of words that all describe some dimension of love. It is not just one word. The three main words that are used for love in that context, in that, in that, in that language, the first one is eros. Everyone say eros. Eros is where we get eroticism from, uh, erotica from. Eros is an instinct that, is, that we all have, and it's an instinct towards connecting with each other. I'm cleaning it up. It's, <laughs> it's an instinct for entanglement. It's an instinct for people coming together instinctively. Uh, we're drawn to each other. We're drawn to be close to each other. We're drawn to touch each other. We are drawn to each other. There's a warming that happens. There's a magnetism that comes. Eros is an instinct, an instinct. But that's not what he's talking about here in this chapter at all. The second one is probably the most prominent of the three types of love that is, is mentioned both in Scripture but in, also in, in Greek is the word phileo. Everyone say phileo. P-H-I-L-E-O. Phileo. Say it again. Phileo is where we get the, it's the root, same root as we get to, for the word Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Uh, phileo is, is in kind. It's a love that is about family. It's about close relations, good feelings and good vibes. It's a, it's a word about feelings. Phileo love is I, I feel feel it. I feel the love for my mother. I feel the love for my family. I feel the love for my children. It's feeling. Everybody say feeling. When you think phileo, think feeling. But here's the thing. And here's the problem with phileo. Phileo goes away. Feelings go away. Now, now you don't have to answer this, but I'd appreciate it if you do. Is there anyone here besides me who's ever been in love with someone and is currently not in love with them anymore. <laughs> Phileo went away. I, I, I got my hand way up. <laughs> the feeling went away. Because here's the thing, you can't sustain a relationship on feelings. Come on now. Oh, look, look. Oh, everything is so wonderful. Uh, you know, we've all seen it. I love him. I love him. Oh, I love him. But you're only 16. I'm going to marry him. I'm a, he's going to be the father of my children. I love him, mama. But you, but, but you don't even know him. And you, you're 16. I'll leave here, mom. If I have to leave here, I'm going to leave with him. I can't. I can't live without him. <laughs> Are 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can I get a witness? <laughs> Where is that person now? You probably don't even know. Yeah. Uh, love that's based on feelings. Phileo is something that is also subject to feelings. I love you till you put your hands on me. Hmm? Unfortunately, some people will say, I love you till you put your hands on me the 15th time. We're praying for y'all, praying for them. I love you until you cross me. I love you till you betray me. I love you till you lie to me. I, I love you till I meet somebody else <laughs> that I love more. <laughs> I love you as long as you have that good job. Phileo is conditional. Eros instinct. Phileo feelings. When I think about Phileo, you know, just to drive it home, y'all know I'm from LA. Y'all probably know, because I've said it before, that I am a huge Laker fan. Huge Laker fan all my life. And, and I think the greatest example of Phileo love I can even bring to you right now is Shaq and Kobe. That's right. Shaq and Kobe were a match made in basketball heaven. I mean, there's nothing wrong. We're talking about maybe the two best players in the whole league on the same team. One tall and, sm and, and big and, and burly and, and strong. One thin and shorter, but uh, just super skilled and, and super athletic. And you put them together. They both had high IQs, high basketball IQs, high motors. They put, put them together in one of the best duos of all time. And they won three in a row, y'all. Three in a row. I went to three parades. Three in a row, y'all. You know, we were rolling. We three-peat, y'all. It was first time in a long time. <sighs> and then something happened. The filet stopped filleting. <laughs> and one day, one of them goes to the owner and says, I can't play with this man anymore. <laughs> it's him or me. Because biological didn't bother. I can't play with him. And they made a good decision, I think. They, they chose the younger, harder worker, higher upside uh, of the two. And Shaq had to go. Now, I often think how many championships would they have won if they could have kept it together? Five, six, seven, eight? Who knows? Shaq goes away and wins another one in Miami. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I told y'all I'm about the front of the jersey, not the back. Shaq goes, yeah, anyway. Kobe gets the three more finals and wins two. But what could have been? And this is what happens when you're in phileo love. When the feelings go away, so does the relationship. So does everything you've built. So does everything that you've had. It goes away as quickly as the feelings go away. Uh, Paul's not talking about Eros. Paul is not talking about phileo when he is doing this love chapter. Every reference in this chapter that says the word love is actually a third Greek word, and that Greek word is agape. A-G-A-P-E, accent agu. Agape. And agape is, has been defined as the God kind of love. Some people will call it unconditional love. Some people will call it selfless love. My favorite definition from, from Strong's Concordance and from some word study is, is one that you never hear anybody else say, so here it comes. Agape is also characterized as moral preference. Let that sit there. It's my favorite one, moral preference. That is, in the face of what I know to be right, I do right. Regardless of my feeling. See, if eros is an instinct and phileo is a feeling, agape is a choice. 
Love, according to Paul, in its highest, highest form, throughout this chapter, which we'll be talking about over the next few weeks, love is a choice. Say love is a choice. choice. Turn to your neighbor and say love is a choice. It's a choice. You can't stay married unless you make a choice. Somebody say amen to that. that. Whether you're still married or not, you should know that's true. It's a choice every day. It's a choice through everything you work through. It's a choice when you're not feeling it. It's a choice when the phileo's not phileoing. It's a choice when you're not even feeling that, that much arrows. All that kind of goes away in the wrong circumstances. It's a choice. Paul is saying that you all look, I'm getting ready to hit you with a lot of stuff about these gifts and these graces, but the bottom line is that the only way for this to work is for you all to make a choice to do moral preference. A choice to do the right thing that you know is the right thing. Oh, come on now. You, 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 you may not be catching this exactly the way I'm trying to put it out there. Uh, try it this way. Um, many of y'all know about my mom. I talk about my mom all the time, but you may not know much about my sister. My sister is 11 years, 11 years older than me. Both of us are adopted. She was first. I was last. 27 foster kids in between. I'm number 29. She's number one. But y'all know that when you're 11 years apart, you might as well be two onlys. You know, you don't grow up close. By the time I was six, my, my sister was in her senior year of high school, and all she wanted to do was make sure people didn't think I was her kid. <laughs> she didn't want to babysit me. She didn't want to take me anywhere because, you know, where we grew up, they, <laughs> they would have said, ah, ah. She's like, no, no. Buddy is my, my brother. That's my baby brother. Shut up, buddy. That's my baby brother. Uh, She didn't want to have much to do with me in in her high school years. (laughs) Uh, But we had the kind of relationship that was respectful. I mean, she's my big sister. Uh, I never had a crossword with her. She never had a crossword with me. Uh, She got married when she was 18. So she was gone. I was six still. So I'm talking talking like we had a a lot of space between us. I go away to school. I go away to work. I don't live in L.A. for most of my adult life been gone since I was 17. Um, As we get to the end of my mother's life around 2007, my mother's now in assisted living. And and she's at a place where she cannot handle her own affairs anymore. So my sister becomes her conservator. I'm in Texas. Made sense. She's older. She's there. She's 20 minutes from my mom. She's in charge. She has power of attorney over all of her all of her affairs. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So my sister's the conservator. And without going into a lot of detail, in 2007, some things went terribly wrong. Horribly wrong. So wrong that I had to call my sister and confront her about some things that were happening that were wrong. Um, It's the first time I'd ever treated my sister like we were equals and peers. And she didn't respond very well to that. Baby brother calling to hold me accountable turned into a very, um, let's just say I was not called a child of God in that conversation. And I'm shocked because I'd never heard this coming towards me from my, from my sister. And the last thing I hear is a dial tone. That's 2007. We have not spoken since. My mother died in 2009. By 2009, I'm trying to reach my sister to tell her that our mother has died and we're going to do a memorial service and all these types of things. I can't find her. And, I, and I, look, y'all, I have friends on the police force and I have friends who are um, still wearing colors. Which means we we usually can find you if we can get both sides of that. We couldn't find her. Two years after that. But by the way, can you imagine my state of mind? If you couldn't, just get here, here it is. I was angry. I was more angry at one person than I'd ever been in my life. And I played football. (laughs) 
church. <laughs> you know, I was angry. And I had that righteous indignation thing going. Like, I'm right, she's wrong, I'm right, I can be angry. I can be as mad, I wish I could say piss, but I, can, I was going to be as mad as I wanted to be. I was mad. Two years later, I, I hear from my cousin who is in touch with both of us, and she says, your sister is in Texas, not far from you, and wants to see you and talk to you. At that point, I hadn't talked to her in four years. And the moment she said, your sister is near, something welled up in me I'd never experienced. It was rage. And after taking a couple of moments, I said to my cousin, tell my sister, I'm not ready yet. Because I knew that if I had met my sister and she, and she said the wrong thing, if the first thing out of her mouth wasn't the right thing, I cannot be responsible for my response. And I knew in that state, I couldn't meet with her. It just didn't make any sense. It was, it was, it was bad. It was bad. At the same time I was doing that, I was in a small group Bible study from our church. I, I recommend this, y'all. Find a group of folks that you do life with folks who are believers and, and that, that y'all can keep it real and do life with, share life with, share scripture with, share prayers with. I was in a wonderful group that met every other week and they were hearing these things and I told them this story. And one of them, never will forget this, looked me straight in the eye and says, said, Christian, you are in the prison of your unforgiveness. Your unforgiveness is controlling you. The fact that we can say, we say her name and your face changes, you, you turn into a person that you're, this is not who you are and this is clearly not who God would want you to be. And then he asked me this question that just messed me up. He said, would your mother want you two to be estranged? I'm telling you right now, there was no phileo at this moment. I wasn't feeling it at all. But I knew that he was right. I knew that with regard to the moral part of moral preference, he was stating the moral. And I wasn't in line with it. And that messed with me. It messed with me until I finally got enough courage and enough courage to counteract my lack of feeling and make a choice. I reached back out to my cousin and told my cousin, I'm ready to talk to her now. Just tell her that, look, tell her I repent. Tell her that I, I know mother would want us to be close. Tell her that I want to be in her life. I'll fly wherever she is. Just tell her I want to be in her life, her family's life. Just please just tell her I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Two days later, my cousin calls me back and says, your sister would like, to le like for me to tell you that now she's not ready. <laughs> Ooh. 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 One, I got to give it to her. She got me. <laughs> she got me. That, that, she, she hit me right back with what I, what I gave her. And it was, it was a rough moment. But here's the thing. She says that to me, and what I thought I'd feel was relief. I'm off the hook. I'm not going to try this again. But what I felt actually was a different kind of relief. It was a release. Because I made the step, I was stepping out of my prison of unforgiveness. I was stepping out of the grudge I was stepping out of phileo where I had none into agape. And in this agape place, while things were not going how I would want them to go, while we were not reconciled, while we have not spoken, I knew that I was actually making a moral preference. I was actually doing something by choice that needed to be done. See, the problem here that is the problem with so many of us who are 
who were in the same prison I was in is that we make the choice to not let love in. I'm talking about agape love. We don't let it in. And furthermore, better way of putting that is we may have agape in us, but we don't let agape win. Oh. Oh, let me let you sit with that for a second. We know what to do. We know we have to go beyond our feelings to do it. And when we don't act, we are letting the forces that would be against love win. See, if I was going to give you a second point, love is a choice. Second point two would be love is a verb. Come on now. Uh, as, as we say on Alondra and Wilmington, talk is cheap. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you, you can talk a great one, talk a good one, but here's what we're talking, here's what we're saying. We're saying that until you actually make that step and do love, it's not love. Hey, here it is, here it is. Uh, uh, my wife's number one love language is acts of service. Okay? And my, my wife gets an endorphin rush when I take out the trash. I mean, it hits her to her core. And if I take out the trash without her having to remind me, oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's not love if I know to take it out and I don't take it out. For her, it's not love if she has to remind me five times. Are y'all hearing me? We're talking about love that is a choice, but that love is a verb. It's something we do. We don't think love. We don't feel love. We do love. Huh? That's what we do. And if you're saying we love the community, show me what you're doing. If you're saying we love the homeless, show me what you're doing about it. If we say we love those who are mentally distressed and going through mental health issues and not doing anything about it, if you say you love and you're showing hate for folks who are different than you, then what are we talking here? If you say we love and we're dehumanizing people coming across a border and treating them like they're less than human, what are we doing here? If we say we are love and people of love and people of agape and someone walks in the, in the room who is not male or female and calls themselves something else and we hate them, what are we doing? Oh, yeah, it got quiet. That's okay. Love is a choice, but love is a verb. And since we talk about it every week and since we do this every week, uh, love is the foundation of significance. It is the ground that significance is built on. A life of significance is saying that I get my gifts, I have gifts, but I have to also have graces. I get my, my gifting and my talents, but I also need to have virtues. And if I make one more than the other one, oh, this is going to be next week. I, I was going to try to get to it to this week, but next week I'm going to talk about love is patient and kind. Child, you don't want to miss that one. <laughs> the week after that, I'm going to talk about how love is not jealous or envious. You really don't want to miss that one. And then we'll end on love never fails. But while we're here, love is the foundation of significance. It is the thing that takes us from being successful and seeing successful as everything to seeing that there's another level of this. It's not just the eros level that is instinctive. It's not just the phileo level that is about our feelings, but it's this agape level that's about our choices and in particular, our moral preference, our tendency to do right to do love. Because of that, we end this the way I usually start, by reminding you that you are these people of love. You are people of agape. You are not people of success even though you're successful. 
you are people of significance. So say it with me. I am significant. Because God says so. I am significant. And I was created to do significant things. Find somebody else in the room and say, you are significant. Because God says so. No, no, no. Look them in the eye and say, you are significant. Because God says so. You are significant. And you were created to do significant things. Now, collectively, we are significant. Because God says so. We are significant. And we were created to do significant things. We clap our hands as people of love, as people of significance, as people of agape. God, you are here and you are with us and you are the one calling us higher. So take us higher, God. Take us beyond our feelings to a place of agape and teach us today and throughout this series how to be more like Jesus and how to do love, how to embody grace, how to embody agape so that we might actually be agents of the transformation of this world. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 You can turn into your, um, your hymnal to uh, page 881 to the Apostles' Creed. Be led by our liturgist uh, as we prepare to approach and partake in the Lord's Supper. Please rise for the reading of the Apostles' Creed as you are able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. You may be seated. Can turn to page uh, 12 in the same hymnal as we observe the service of word and table two. Uh, in the Methodist church, in our tradition, the table of Christ is open to all, regardless of your affiliation, regardless of your church, whether you do uh, communion once a month or once a day or not at all, you are welcome to this table. Christ our Lord invites us to the table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here ends our corporate prayer of confession. Now, if you would, go to the Lord with your personal confessions in silence now. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Yeah, glory to God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they did eat. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you, for many and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And they did drink. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church in all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us once again pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, do it in remembrance of him. And now the cup of Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. We serve those now who serve us. Come to the table, kneel as you can. Take the bread, the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, 
remember. Now the cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. Now rise in God's grace and go to serve in God's peace. Beloved, come to the table, kneel as you are able. Take the bread, the body of Christ, broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, remember. Now take the cup. This is the, body, the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And every time you do, I want you to remember. Now rise in God's grace and go in God's peace. Love it, come to the table, kneel as you're able. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, remember. Now take the cup. It's the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take drink and every time you do remember now rise in God's grace and go in God's peace Beloved, come to the table, kneel as you're able. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ, broken for you, given for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, remember. And now the cup. It's the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. Now rise in God's grace and go in God's peace. to the table, beloved. Take the bread. This is the body of Christ, broken for you, given for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, 
remember. Now the cup, the cup of Christ. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. Now rise in God's grace. Go in God's peace. Choir, take the bread. It's the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and every time you do, remember. Now the cup. It's the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and every time you do, remember. Let us pray. To the God who invites us with love that is unconditional to the table. To the God who goes beyond our feelings and meets us in a place of choice. To the God who chooses to love and sustain us moment by moment, day by day. We offer ourselves now as gifts to you. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. And it's in this moment we are one. It's in this moment that we connect with your, your work of salvation. It's in this moment we connect with your moment of unconditional love we call agape. And we are grateful. Use us in your service, God. Free us from the prison of our unforgiveness. Loose us so that we might be the ones who do love and are significant. We pray this in gratitude for this table in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Excuse me, guys. A stewardship moment. Sorry. During this, the moment in our service when we receive offerings, I invite you to consider all the ways of giving. You might drop off your envelope as you leave the sanctuary. Make a secure donation online with Gively or Vanco. Scan the QR code on the back of your worship bulletin or send a check to the address listed on the front of the bulletin. Have you sponsored a radio broadcast to share the message with those who are sick, shut in, or far away? Think about adorning the altar with a spray of flowers to celebrate an occasion or honor a loved one. To order flowers or sponsor a radio broadcast, visit the Holman website or contact Holman at HolmanUMC.com. There are many avenues of giving. Prayerfully consider them and let your heart lead you to the offering that best honors your relationship with God. We thank you for your continued generosity in support of the mission and vision of Holman United Methodist Church. 
Our announcements are as follows. Our worship bulletin post announcements and advertisements of events, services, and opportunities, including the children's Sunday school lesson and weekly meetings. I would like to highlight the following. Wednesday Night Live continues this Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Join Pastor Christian at 7 p.m. in White Hall for a biblical exploration of the five love languages. Come for refreshments at 6.30 p.m. Now Ministries will meet Sunday, May 4th, 2024, from 12 noon till 3 p.m. in room 204 of the Multipurpose Building. Home United, Meth Hope Home United Women in Faith announced their 2024 Mother's Day recognition categories. Nominate yourself a friend or family member for the oldest mother in attendance, mother with the most children present, mother with the most generations present, or mother with the youngest child. Please connect with us as we gather for a dynamic worship, grow through inspired learning, go into joyful service, and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your continued partnership in ministry. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. I'm going to take uh, John the Baptist privileges. If you know the story, John the Baptist was out in the uh, in the water, dunking people, baptizing people, and Jesus walks up and wants to be baptized. And John Baptist is like, no, I can't. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm going through this too. Baptize me. Uh, I'm not saying that Victor Cyrus Franklin is Jesus. <laughs> but since I am metaphorically John the Baptist, the one who is preparing the way, it would be beyond me not to acknowledge that the, pr the presence of your pastor in waiting, Victor Cyrus Franklin's in the building. Just. Yeah. If he, feel, if he wants to, he'll be out there afterwards to shake hands on the way out if he wants to. I'm not putting that on you if you don't want to. If you've got you to run to, um, uh, you know, Harold and Bells or somewhere, I get it. You know. <laughs> I also want to just take a moment to, to thank you for your generosity. Um, uh, Holman, y'all have been stepping up. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for your, your tithes and your offerings and your generosity that went all through a time when you all were all online and continues now and has even continued with your interim pastor here. I just want to thank you for all that give, all that who give, and even those, as we used to say, who would like to give but aren't, aren't able. I pray God's blessing on all of you. God bless you as we close. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest with you, rule and abide with you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We hope that you have enjoyed our broadcast today and that it met a spiritual need in your life. If it was helpful, you can support this radio ministry by donating online at holmanchurch.com or by calling the church office at 323-703-5868. Again, that's 323-703-5868 or online at holmanchurch.com. That's H-O-L-M-A-N, holmanchurch.com. Com. Holman Church is located at 3320 West Adams Boulevard. That's Adams Boulevard and 4th Avenue in the historic West Adams District of Los Angeles. We wish God's blessing on you to have a wonderful week and thank you for sharing this time with the Holman United Methodist Church on radio station KJLH 102.3 FM. And everywhere on the internet via the Holman Church YouTube channel. Remember, you can contribute and find out more about us at HolmanChurch.com. We hope to hear from you and see you soon. Yeah, yeah.